uh, forget this place. Or one of those things where, you know how some people, when you quit a job, you're like, man, I ain't going to never need them people. And blah, blah, blah. And that one little act of kindness that you do to somebody that, that to you it was nothing may be the one thing that somebody may can help you with later on in life. Hey, let's tap in, let's tap in. Yo, 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 happy Friday, happy Friday. Y'all know what's going on. It's QTV in the building, man. We hope everybody's doing well, man. Also, we want to do a little cross promotion, man. Y'all be sure to make sure y'all go over to Peacock's Incorp, man. That is where I am founder and president, Project Keep Them Off the Streets, man, where our mission is to uh, equip youth participants with the knowledge and skills to manage their individual finances, man. We understand what financial literacy is. Y'all get on over there, visit www, the World Wide Web at PCOTS.org. Y'all know we got to support the youth and the youth is the future. You dig what I'm saying? So let's get that going. And guess what? Another special uh, guest in the building. The champ is here. The champ is here. You dig what I'm saying? <laughs> the green room. Finally. Hey. CEO of Clippers and Cops. He has retired as an investigator for the APD. He survived the block and he took the Glock. Welcome to QTV, Mr. Tyrone Dennis, man, a.k.a. Ty. What up, Doc? What's going on, Q? How you doing, man? Long time, long see. Good to long see time. you. Long time. well, man. Thank you, sir. Likewise, likewise, man. All is well on my end, sir. What are you? Where, where are you and what are you doing, sir? <laughs> uh, currently, I'm in St. Louis. I am the safety director for Rockwood School District. My old school district where I went to school from six through uh, graduating high school. Uh, so I basically moved back home after retiring from Atlanta Police Department. Awesome. Also, so you are originally born and bred in St. Louis. Man, I'm I'm St. Louis uh, baby boy. Uh, I'm I, St. Louis favorite son. Atlanta's baby boy. Man, I basically have two homes. I was born and raised in St. Louis. Uh, then I went to college, and then I moved to Atlanta in 2004. And so I was in Atlanta for 16 and a half years, which is uh, a chunk of my life. So um, I basically got two homes, man, Atlanta and St. Louis. For sure, for sure, man. Shouts out to St. Louis, man, and most definitely, man, shouts out to the ATL, man. Y'all stand up, yes, stand up, man. So, um, yes, so, uh, man, how's your family, bro? How's your family, man? Beautiful family, sir, man. How's everybody doing? Thank you, man. Married 16, and 16 years, just celebrated my 16th wedding anniversary. I got three children, a 16-year-old daughter, a 9-year-old daughter. Hey and, man, uh, happy anniversary, man! And, and, and salute to that, to that, to that kingdom, man. Your nation, man. I appreciate it, man. Hey, I, I tell people, man, try to take care of home, try to stay together. Uh, my kids and our our young people need both parents, whether together or separated. Make sure that you're involved in your kids' life. Uh, one of the precious things that I enjoy every day is the ride home and the ride to school with my kids. And I, I tell people often, man, I don't have to, somebody else don't have to tell me about what's going on in my kid's life because I have my kids with me to tell me themselves. And I enjoy hearing how their day is and being able to kiss them off the school and stuff like that. Man, hey, man, hey, man, hey, man, two hands salute to that, man. And most definitely, and for you, for you ladies and gentlemen that's out there, man, that may, may not be with the, the uh, better half of your offspring, learn how to co-parent. Learn how to cope, man. Don't let the relationship be where the, the child, the child suffers. Right, bro? That's it. The whole thing about it is whether y'all together or not, you got to do what's best for your kids. And then hurt people hurt people. So if you display negativity and the toxic relationship to your kids, your kids are going to feed on that. And so you have to show them um, a different way and try to show them other ways to even handle your anger and different things like that. I have to catch myself 
from cursing and saying different things in front of my kids because then if they say the same thing, I'm going to be mad. But what do I think they learned it from? For sure, for sure. And uh, and they just the innocent that they want to be, man. And, I, and, I, and I'm always telling people too, man, to be honest with you, nobody knows what they know until they was introduced to it. That's it. And a lot of people act as if they got it out the mud by themselves. I don't care if you <laughs> Rob Steele, a lawyer, a doctor, somebody along the way taught you how to do those things or pointed you in the right right direction to do those things. Most people become what they see. And that's why a lot of our people become products of our environment because we we grow up in the trap and never thinking about what that truly means. Uh, when a mouse gets trapped or stuck on a mouse trap, he basically is dragging that trap, trying to get himself free, only take making himself further stuck. And through it all, he don't even realize he just killed himself slowly. And so those are things that we as people have to think about. Like anything that we do could be ruining where God wants us to be and where we, we're we supposed to be trying to do something against that uh, long-term plan. Man, you talking that talk, man. You put some smoke in the city, fam. And, <laughs> and also, even with the, uh, the youth, man, like um, what I try to explain to the parents too, man, what you just, what we just said about the visual, we become what we see. And that's why we tell the youth, man, that's why it's important to dream, man. You know, a project, keep them off the streets. That's one of our slogans. That is our slogan, man. You know, um, it's okay to dream, but don't sleep too long. But we want them to dream. And when you dream, dream big. And when you understand that, huh? Say it again, my brother. No, oh, you froze up on us. But yeah, what I was saying, you, become, you back? I'm sorry, I'm driving. Hey, forgive, forgive me, I'm driving uh, home, so I'm trying to, uh, it may jump off and on, depending not on a, Not a problem, not a problem. I'm still in that slogan, though, man. That's that's pretty deep. Uh, I had a gang member. Uh, when I worked for Atlanta Police, I did six and a half years on patrol, and then I was a detective, and I was a gang detective. I'm certified as a gang expert in state, federal, and civil court. I got my own consulting business as a gang expert. And what that means is they literally, uh, attorneys will hire me to come in to explain the gang evidence in a case or the lack thereof. And a gang member told me this. Shouts out to my guy, David Hamilton, man. His name's Super Crip. For y'all don't know who he is, he's from Compton. Uh, he's currently in custody, but Google him. Uh, he's famous, <laughs> but he became a friend of mine mentoring the kids. And he told me, he said, uh, you have to change in order to change somebody's life. You have to change their people, places and things. And if you don't change that, it's going to be virtually impossible to change their life. Because when you think about what he's saying, recidivism, recidivism is for someone that went to prison and come back home and they reoffend. So if you re offended and they send you right back to the same block, same project, same whatever, chances are you're going to do the same stuff again because once you get out all the good stuff that you may have learned or the different classes that you took they're going to go out the window because once you get back to your uh the environment that you offended in you're going to see your old friends old homies and you're going to get that urge it's just like telling somebody that so dope to work a nine to five they're trapped mentally thinking i can't wait two weeks for a thousand dollars after taxes I can go sell a, a pack and get that in a day. And so it, it it basically brainwashes our people into thinking that that's the way to go when it's so much legal money out here that you don't have to rob, steal, scam, or do anything. You can do so many things to make money. Hey, man, you, man, you, that's, 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 that's nailing it, man. That's why the program we we pushing right now is the financial literacy is to show them like, Hey man, you can, you can, you can really be whatever you want to be. And we're trying to be in front of the curve and, and, uh, and give them this information uh, up front before they reach the penal system. Right. So we're trying to have, create all these preventative measures. And I, I, I believe like what's going on, which has always been going on, but it's, this thing is all about influence, man. There, there's not enough people like you and myself in the slew of other people. And I'm always telling parents, hey, when they walk, when you finishing what you just said, 
when they get out and when they go back to their natural environment. And that was one of the things I used to think about too, man, when we went out and mentor, I'm like, you know what? We can go to all these schools and we can talk to these kids for 30 minutes or whatever. And then, but when they leave school, it I know the impact is great, but those 30 minutes compared to those 23 hours in their community and they go back to those influences. So I have always wondered, like, we got to come up with a solution for the follow up. A lot of them kids, they want to change, but it, they're not old enough to change what you just said. The mind, the, the, the places that they that they live in. That's correct. And so as we do Clippers and Cops, uh, we did we started. We started in a barbershop in 2018, and that's awesome because we get to talk to the community, and usually that's older people. And then what I discovered, uh, I had been mentoring since 2004, going to school, started with Project Grad, uh, then met Reese and with uh, with the radio station, uh, Maurice Sweeney. Maurice, man. And correct, that's my guy. We played ball together. He didn't know I was a cop. For and sure. then uh, – I'm dunking on people, and he's like, hold up. And then he saw me put on the uniform. But by doing that mentoring, uh, I learned that you have to stay on these kids. And once we start doing Clippers and Cops Campus Invasion going into the schools, it's exactly what you said. When we have them for those two hours, we're able to change and take the blinders off their mind. But it's difficult for some of them to apply it when they go back into the environments in which they live in because they have a survivor mechanism to survive in that in that setting um, for myself. I felt like me growing up, I got two educations every day. I got an inner city hood education and then I caught a bus an hour away and got a suburban education. And so at my high school, going to a white school, a uh, suburban school, it wasn't an if I was graduating, it was a where I'm going to college type thing. Nobody dropped out and things like that. Uh, but me, I still had ways of where I come from. So if I felt like somebody disrespected me, I was ready to fight. And unfortunately, that cost me Division One scholarships and things like that because one of my friends was like, hey, if I get to fight, you got my back. We're at this suburban school, right? What type of fighting there? What is really going on here, right? He comes and says, if I get to fight, you got my back. I'm like, yeah, where they at? And when they got to fight, I jumped in the fight and got hit with a trash can, and I start fighting the guy who had did nothing to me. And the teacher who came to grab me was a white teacher, uh, Mr. Kendall. And he was uh, short, but I'm 6'5". So he put me in a little chicken wing move, and I'm like, let me go before I steal you. Like, that's St. Louis slang for punch. He put in my suspension. I said, I'll kill you. So I got a 10-day suspension with a re recommendation to the Board of Education. With that recommendation, they decided to uphold my suspension for the remainder of the school year, which was my senior year. I only needed a half a credit to graduate. So I'm sitting in long-term suspension for the remainder of the year, couldn't go to prom. And then I got escorted to my seat at graduation. And right before we took the caps and gowns off, they escorted me out. That moment, the son would be like, damn, that's messed up. Yeah, it's messed up. But it was the best thing that ever happened in my life because that storm, actually clear the path to where I am. Um, I had Division One schools ready to sign me out of high school. I was basically picking through who I, where I wanted to go, and th that incident made them pull back, forcing me to go to a community college. At that community college is where I met my professor. I chose to major in criminal justice. I was the first person in my family to go to college, first person in my neighborhood to go to college. So I didn't know what to major in. I'm going through my course catalog, and I saw criminal justice, and I'm like, well, I know crime and gang banging, so I already know criminal justice. <laughs> so when I major in it, I'm the only black student in the major. And so in my class, my professor was a former FBI agent. So he not knowing, and I'm not knowing that I just got this awesome education from the school I went to. When he's asking questions, I'm able to hold my own in class lectures and stuff like that. Yeah. So one day he come to me and was like, Mr. Dennis, what are you trying to do with your degree? And at 18, I'm like, I don't know. I'm here to play ball. He like, no, after college. And I'm like, I don't know why. What? He was like, have you ever thought about going in the FBI? At the time, I'm like, the feds? Never. <laughs> Never would I do that. 
he said, well, as a minority, I think that'll be a good career path for you. And that's what got me into law enforcement. He said, I got my associate. I'm a bad boy. Uh, right. Well, I said, never said, I'm that. a bad boy. That's it. But at, coming from where I came from, that was foreign because everybody I, everybody I knew either sold dope, uh, Rob still did her, or work go work for the city or work for the trash man or something, or try to get on that Chrysler or something like that. That's what sure. people did. So and my, I never thought about what I, you know how when you're young, people always say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I thought I was going to the NBA. You know what I'm saying? Knowing how far-fetched that thinking is. <laughs> and what I learned is basketball was a tool and a vessel to take me it only could take me so far. And so, no, so, 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 so let me, let me ask you this then. Was, was, was basketball that little thing that changed the trajectory in your, in your, in your direction to make it out? Yes and no. Basketball, so I'm the youngest of four. I was raised by a single pair of moms. Shouts out to my mom, Cecilia Savage. Shouts out to mom, and, dude, man. And my yeah. grandma. They, great job, they great job, know, right? <laughs> And my grandma. Hey, she, my mom was real. Me and my mom still to this day still have a relationship where I can always talk to my mom. And I love her for that because I've been able to discuss anything with her and feel comfortable and saying it. Some people can't talk to their parents. And my mom always raised us right. My grandma always raised us right. But I had older siblings. I got two old, an older sister and two older brothers, and they jumped. Uh, they would, they played sports. My brothers did, but we grew up in the late eighties and the early nineties when crack hit, and they jumped off the porch. And all three of them wouldn't allow me to jump off the porch. They, they basically said, "You gonna make." It. So I never had to hustle or do anything because one would buy my, my pants, one would buy my shirts, and the other one would buy my shoes if my mom did. And so I. The main reason that a lot of guys jump off the porch is you don't want to be dusty. You don't want to be broke. You want New George. You want to be fresh. Yeah, that let go. That let go will push you out there, bro. That's what will push everybody out there. Once you start getting hair on your chest, girls start, you start smelling yourself and girls start looking at you and stuff. That makes you start thinking about ways to get money. And if you go home. Look, look, look. look, look, He go go through things. Them empty pockets. That empty stomach, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the dusty right. fuck, it gonna put, it'll push you right there quick, man. That's it. But they wouldn't let me, man. I remember one summer I tried to jump off the porch and they somebody else was like, man, your brother will beat, you, beat me if I let you sit out here. Man. <laughs> you better go. You know what I'm saying? And I appreciate them. That, that's why I don't judge anybody because the difference between me being a cop most of my life and a regular citizen is one mistake. And my, I myself could have made that same mistake, but thank God that I was I was saved and spared to be able to do something different. So I try to have empathy for people when they do make mistakes because you don't know what what factors came into play to force them down that path, you know. And so with and that, influence um, again, they influence. Yeah, but sports saved my life because sports kept me busy. An idle mind is a devil's workshop. Everybody can't play sports. Everybody can't hoop. Everybody ain't fast. Everybody football, whatever. You have to find something for these kids to do, to your kid or whomever, to keep their minds occupied. I don't care if they if they not athletic, put them in STEM. Let them learn how to do other things to make money. Teach them a business. Put them in a place to be able to edu- be educated, and they don't even know that they're doing work. They think it's fun. You know what I'm saying? Coding. There's coding for kids. There's ways they can make money online and things like that. And when you when you think about that, the reason I say I talk about sports is because I coach. I coach basketball. And I have to explain to them. It's not called athlete student. It's called student athlete. And I know a lot of guys that play ball with me that were better. I was never the best at no level of when I played ball. But I, I probably went further than most because I was relentless to it you know what i'm saying i set yeah, goals yeah. for myself go i somebody just asked me what what would you tell somebody to that was on a journey early in their life a young teen early 20s set goals for yourself goals is the roadmap to success 
how do you know if you, when you accomplish something if you ain't set no goal to get there? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And as you accomplish a goal, scratch that off and set another goal. I'm, I'm addicted to success, man. Like, me accomplishing something to me is, is, is a great uh, milestone, a great thing because I set out to do something. But I'm greedy. I want more. And I feel like God gave me the ability to think and use my brain to do so much more. And as I embark on life, I'm 44 years old. A lot of the stuff I've accomplished, I'm, I've am i been working without a net for almost 20 some odd years because after a certain point, my mom often tells me this. She's like, son, I was happy with you just graduating high school. She said, then you graduated from and got your associate's degree. Then you graduated and got your bachelor's degree. She said, then you became a cop and left Atlanta police after 16 years as one of the most decorated officers that ever came through. Most officers do 30 years. Hold on. All my awards. Jack, we're going to get Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Because <laughs> I'm so sure going to. You're over there listening like, hold on, boy. Let me, let me, I got questions for you. Yeah, yeah, look, I saw, but see, I want to, I want to, some of those things that you're saying is so major, man. I really, I, I really don't want you to just shoot past it, man, because I really want to highlight it. You know what I mean? Right. And, um. Right. Uh, you, 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 uh, you most definitely, man, um, uh, is a, is a blessing, man. And I, and I, and I told you earlier too, man, that, um, wish we had more people like you, man. I, I wish when I was actually growing up, man, that I, I, I ran across yourself or someone of, of your caliber, man. You know what I'm saying? Cause a lot of times exactly, what youth normally choose, sometimes it wasn't no options, bro. My mom tell me today, she like she commend me on the things that I'm doing, but she was like, I always wanted to find you a mentor. She said she she was just like, I couldn't find nobody. So the things I got into probably was because huh? Go ahead. The things you yeah, she said, you know, she's always said that she was she wish that uh she would have found you know a a a a figure you know what I'm saying that to be in my life as a as a role model to give me those those gems and those nuggets, man. You, you understand what I'm saying? Now I'm, I'm gonna take it back for a minute, man. Slow it down a little bit. Like <laughs> you remember how we met, bro? I do. We met at the 107.9 event with the kids at the school. No, no. Did we? I thought the radio station, right? Was it the meeting at the radio station? Yeah, with the, at the radio station. Yeah, it was the uh, the, the one hundred seven nine, uh, the Bullet is not hot tour. Yeah, and I was invited by Art Powell, man. And shout out to that guy, man, Art Powell, man. That's, okay, that's, that's who connected me with my, all the other people, man. That Art Powell is a, a good friend of mine as well, yes. and he and I have crossed paths over the years, mentoring and doing the same stuff. And the reason that I appreciate Art is. Art has a crazy story about going to prison, being chased and shooting at the police. And then he, my buddy, being a police. So who would think that we would be friends? <laughs> but I love Art being with me whenever I went, because I, even though some people may say, oh, you you real as hell. The moment I say I'm a police, some people are turned out to me. And I understand that fact. But Art is going to tell you, from his standpoint, whether you listen to me or not, you go between the two of us, one of us is going to catch your ear. And I like Art just because people talk to them about hand to hand combat. You know, he do you jujitsu and stuff like that. And right. being in a prison cell, there ain't no Dracos, ain't no Extendos in prison. <laughs> and if you can't fight, you got a problem, big dog. You got a problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's what I, I appreciate Art for that. For man. sure, man. For sure, man. And shout out to Art Power, man. Hopefully, man, me and that guy can touch bases, man, again, man. And uh, hopefully get him on the show soon. You dig what I'm saying? So I just wanted to pay homage to that, man, because, you know, I've some stuff. And even with his program, man, we had it came together, man. I was able to uh, hold down one of his programs in the uh, the Cal County, man. So, again, man, shout out to uh, Art Power, man. You know what I'm saying? For the connection, man. I've always seen him, you know what I'm saying, for a round up a good, powerful team, man, from now to, to even back then, man. So I, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity he, he gave me as well, man. So I wanted to speak on that publicly. You dig what I'm saying? Yes, sir. He does something with uh, called Credible Messenger, and he also yeah. did – uh, real. We did. Real I just, I think I just, saw, I just ran across that page, or I saw the T-shirt on somebody's page, just like day before yesterday or something. Correct. And so we used to, he and I, uh, used to do something with uh the U.S. Attorney's Office. Shout out to Danielle Wiley. Uh, she does community affairs for the out of the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we used to do something called real, real talk with uh real talk with the law. 
and we used to talk about uh, the law and helping guys understand. Some guys, it's almost like jump off the porch into the streets, not even knowing the game that they're playing. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you don't even know. The, how can you win at a game if you don't even know the rules to the game? The law. <laughs> the law. <laughs> the I, law. Because I, because I teach a lot of um, – I, I, I don't say teach, but I do show – information dealing with like credit law stuff uh um uh being in the p system programs that i had taken you know upon my release and stuff like that man i'm like how can we say things about the you know that we're living in a place that's governed by law but no one knows laws exactly that's 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 like trying to go play a basketball game and you running the ball like you're playing football you don't you're gonna lose not knowing the rules of the game and as you explain, a lot of times as a detective and as a cop, people used to come across my desk, and by then it was too late. I can't explain the law to you after you've broken it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, it's too late. Now I have a job to do, and that's why I love mentoring because I want to touch. My goal is to touch as many lives as I can in a positive way to help change people's lives, to, to help somebody that can't provide nothing to you but a thank you is a priceless thing, man. And when you see these guys again and they didn't change their life and you probably don't even remember the encounter all the way. And they, they, they get so happy to see you and just say, thank you. And they feel like, man, let me buy you lunch. And you like, Oh, it's good. I appreciate it. And that, that is what motivates me, man. I just had a kid I met in March or February and he had, just got locked up. His mom scraped up the money to get him bonded out. And they brought him to my event, Clippers and Cops. One of my sergeant, uh, Sergeant Taylor Lee, she went mentor to the kid. And so I like, well, we got Clippers and Cops, bring them through. When he gets there, he's like, man, I don't want to be here with 12 and all like, you know, giving that attitude. And so me, just for the record, I am a real, real Let's, okay, I ha I'm a cop, but I'm, a, I'm like, buddy, I ain't got to be here if you don't want to. I didn't ask for you to be here. I said, you can leave if you want to. I don't care. I said, but I promise you, if you stay, you're going to learn something. And what made me like the kid, they start, we started talking about some of the parents need to be held accountable for some of the actions of some of these kids. And he actually stepped up and defended his mom. And I, that made me like him. Like, he's taking responsibility for his actions, and he's not letting nobody come for his mom. And yeah, so cool. afterward, I, I went and talked to him, and I said, hey, give my, hear my number, man. I want to mentor you. I don't live here, but I will talk to you in any way I can. And I asked him, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up or when you get out of Like, when you, what do you want to do for a career? He said, man, I want to be an airplane pilot. I said, Hey, how you gonna be an airplane pilot smoking weed? <laughs> I said, come on, dog. I said, think about that. I said, would you fly with somebody that's high? He's like, yeah, that's true. So I started sending them different memes, scriptures. Uh, I talked to him about goal setting and writing that stuff down. Man, this kid went from a 1.6 GPA to a 3.5 within a few months. He runs cross country. He's gotten a job. He's doing so well. And I'm trying to work to see if we can get help get his 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 case expunged because he's done everything I've asked him. You feel me? And everybody makes a mistake, and some kids need a second chance. Right. And we can't arrest our way out of these problems. And a lot of the programs that are in place are we we putting a band-aid on the ocean and expecting it to stop. It. And it's like we can arrest as many many people as we want and it's still not going to stop the problem right we need like you said if you had a better mentor or a, a male figure in your life to help you understand navigating life your life could have possibly been different and a lot of people don't understand that mentoring and having somebody to be able to talk and confide in is a big thing that's a big deal you know what, brother Ty? Like you, know, you, know you know what, too, brother Ty? I, even even scriptural says that we should always seek counsel. This is for grown people. So imagine, right. imagine when a person just really think about the youth growing up with all of this, all of these distractions 
and don't have counsel, don't have a counselor, or don't have a mentor, big brother, father figure in, in their life. And, 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 and sometimes when we do, they were the same perpetrators that introduced the illegal activities and drugs to us. You know what I'm saying? The big, the, 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 the big homie. Anytime I hear somebody say the big homie, you have to ask yourself, a big homie, a real big homie, a real big brother is not going to direct you to something bad. They're going to direct you to something good or try to help you change your life for the better. Because nobody that truly cares about you is going to direct you to failure or direct you to a path that they went through that did work. Right. Because if you went to prison and you telling somebody else to rob, steal, and kill, what type of big homie are you? You a parasite running that kid's life. You know what I'm saying? You should be telling them to do better, do different. Counsel, you a counselor. <laughs> you a counselor. That's it. And, and so when I hear people say things about um, um, my big homie or my big bro, you have to, I, I often ask them, in what way? Because are they providing you guidance to be better? Or are they just... You another little ho a little flunky that they got you doing something that they can't do on themselves or something along those lines. And you getting used in the bruise, man. That's it. Hey, big time. Let me ask you this then, man. Uh, um, so I'm reading, man. Retired, most decorated officer, man. Only after 16 years, man. So I know that's a lot of one of work in a short time, man. Tell us a little bit about you know what I'm saying what you can, man. About that about, about that role to success, man. On 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 the being decorated, man. Well, what that means is I'm one of, matter of fact, here you go. I'm home. There we go. <laughs> I see you moving and grooving. Man, look, look at that shrine, man. <laughs> Woo wee. Big ups on so, all, all those what's crazy on that. Proud, proud of you, my brother. I appreciate it. The crazy part about that is. That stuff was in boxes when I was in Atlanta, to be honest with you, because I didn't really – I would get an award, say thank you, and then put it up. And so it wasn't until I moved here and uh, I got an office that I'm like, why well, I got all my stuff in boxes? I should show it. And then somebody else told me that. They said, man, you probably, if not you one of, or if not one of the most decorated officers that came through. And then that, to me, that was humbling because a lot of the officers – do 30 years. I did 16 and a half. You know, so like, I did, you know just in 16, I was like, well, what's the what's the what's the story behind the 16? Okay, so I wasn't looking to retire. I wasn't looking to leave or anything of the sort. I loved yeah. Atlanta. I loved my job. Um, I had no problems. I was good in the streets, everything. But my coach, my basketball coach, actually called to check on me during the George Floyd uh unrest. Because, you know, everybody watching the news, they just called to make sure you are all right. That conversation turned into, hey, you know I'm trying to get you back. And I'm like, well, coach, you can't afford me. He's like, well, what if I found a way to afford you? And I'm like, all right. I'm thinking he's just talking. You know how people uh, cap, you know what I'm saying? I'm thinking he's just capping. <laughs> well, he in touch with the guy that became my eventual boss. And he went to my rival school. And he, he was a couple of years younger than me, but he remembered me from basketball. He and I talked for about two hours and he ended the conversation with what would it take for you to leave Atlanta? And I'm like, oh, snap. He made me feel like a school age girl because as a police officer, nobody ever asks you what you want or care how you feel or nothing. They just do your job. Right. So when he said that, I come home and I ask my wife and I'm like, my wife went to school here in Missouri. So I'm like, what you think about moving back to St. Louis? And she was like, I was ready for you to get out of that police stuff. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Where did this come from? We never talked about that. And so that was that. And then we were on 12-hour shifts. So I worked 12 p.m. to 12 midnight. And when I got home, my daughter was 12. She came up and hugged me. And it's like, Daddy, I don't want you to be the police no more. And that was the, the dagger because I had to go to the other room. They started the protocol back, right? <laughs> and so I came up with a list of demands, called them back, thinking that, I'm going to highball him, and maybe he'll say no. Like, yeah, we ain't going to do that. He literally called his boss, 
who happened to be married to one of my teammates. And they on vacation in Hawaii. And he told them, and she said, her husband, who was my teammate, said, I follow Ty and everything that he does. If y'all can get him whatever he asked for, y'all need to give it to him. And she called him back and she told him to do it. He called me back within five minutes and said, done deal, what you going to do? So I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> Dang. Like, I was, I thought I was went too high. And so we were still – what people don't understand is during the George Floyd protests, it was still crime and still shootings and stuff still going on in Atlanta. So we were working a big investigation, and I was one of the lead detectives. And so I had to do a presentation in front of the chief and our upper management. And after we left, a judge friend, Judge Craig Schwal, called me. And he was like, Ty, I'm just checking on you. How you doing? And I'm like, ah, I just want to let you know I'm about to retire. And he got pissed. He was like, shit, if you leaving, what does that mean about the state of our department? And I said, I don't know. So he said, I'll call you back. So he called uh, Mark Winnie with uh, WSB. And I knew Mark Winnie for years. And Mark called me like, Ty, I want to do a story. And I'm like, well, if I do a story, I'm not hiding my face, shielding my voice, because I ain't got nothing to be ashamed. I've never done anything wrong. I've done my job correctly. And they people need to understand, as police officers, we got options, too. Like, I don't have to just sit here and take what you give me. I, my credentials speak for itself. I can find a job anywhere. And so Mark Winnie did a story. The story went viral. I had... 15 job offers from all over the country coming in. Like, hey, come to Austin, Texas. Come to Colorado. We'll take <laughs> it. Like, the just open up for you. That's it. But I had already set my sights on coming home and being around my family. My mom is getting older, being around my mom, being able to see my nieces and nephews that I didn't get to see but twice, three times a year and stuff like that. And the thing about being in Atlanta, I always felt separated from when people say, what high school you went to? And you like, oh, I ain't from here, dog. I ain't yeah. go to do it. You know what I'm saying? So that started it. And so I basically took the director of school safety position. It was a new position. And I moved back home, man. And it, it's been, I've been here now. I'm in my fourth year. Uh, and I, I retired August of 20. And so it's been a change of pace. Uh, I'm used to dealing with gang members and killers. And right, I right, deal right. With the so you get you get you get a, you can get a little rest now, <laughs> a little bit. It has different problems, but it's not yeah. as serious. Like we were dealing with life or death with the cases that I worked. I worked. I've had. Dinner and then you was on the clock life. too, so you know what I'm saying. You were on the clock, yeah, so now like, yeah, you tired now, so you can kind of a. Hey. Well, I can focus on my program, which is Clippers and Cops. I love doing Clippers and Cops, and the reason for it is just like you said. I want people to be to be able to see me. My biggest fear when I became a cop was letting my badge change me. And I feel like after I left, I changed it. Uh, because nobody gave me, uh, people often ask me, who gave you the idea to start that? Nobody. I felt I was different. The moment I walked in the door, I knew I was different. I knew I came from a different walk of life. And I wanted to make policing look like what I feel like policing needed and what right. we needed to better you know what i'm saying we can't keep doing the same things expecting a different result and so what happens is when i go get my haircut it, it's no holds bar everybody has a voice it could be the the garbage man it could be a doctor a lawyer it could be a cop it could be a, a, a somebody that sell dope everybody has an equal voice and so i thought about the setting and initially i was going to do all men and we we sit there and have men talk after we did the first one, a mom reached out to me and she basically was like, I want to bring my my son. I'm a single parent. I want to bring my son, just like you said, to hear some of these men talk. Man. I couldn't exclude her. I didn't right. want to exclude her because she had that voice. And uh, with that voice, we, we were able to, uh, you know, I've learned so much from not only different people but i've learned stuff from activists i have friends that are frontline activists and we 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 share strategies and and help them understand what certain things don't mean uh then we rolled out the shoot don't shoot simulator for all the people that say well they should have did this or try it for yourself and see how in a split second some of these things can go 
haywire. I, we're not saying that every cop is right, but we also ain't saying that every cop is wrong. Yeah, I, for me, I heard you say that on a lot of occasions too, man. I, I've heard you say that on a lot of occasions, man. And um, talking about that Clippers and cops, man, and what I've seen, man, I've, I've I've never seen anything like it, man. Even when you post videos, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm, I'm looking and watching, man. I'm I'm like. Cause in, in the beginning, because I was like, I was like, what is this? But I've always been a fan and watched, you know, what what you put up there, right? I'm like, man, this this is this is what's up. So that so so matter of fact, talking about clippers and cops, man. Let's let's get into it, man. Give us the platform, you know how it come about, man, and and um, what's the uh, what's the mission, man? And you know, we'll get into like telling people how to be a part, how they can support, you know, like, man. So let, let, let's talk about it, man. Clippers and cops, uh, uh, bro, Ty. So, like I said, I mentored since 2004, and then in 20 when when Trayvon Martin happened first, mm -hmm. you know, police officer, I have my own opinions about what happened and felt a certain way, was upset about it myself. But we still got to go to work. So then you think of all the other officer incidents that happened, and then Ferguson happened, which is in St. Louis. And so, of course, that hit real close to home. But growing up in St. Louis, that people think that Ferguson was all about Mike Brown, and it wasn't. Ferguson was about a system that had been in place for decades. That Living here, we all knew it. If you drove through Fer Ferguson, it's like a Riverdale or something, East Point, small city. And if you came through there, you four black heads in a car, you getting pulled over. Period, point blank. Y'all can be. Y'all may not have been doing nothing. They gonna pull you over. Why? Because their their funding for their city was generated off traffic stops, and they basically funded it off our backs. That's what the Department of Justice study showed everybody. And then when Mike Brown happened, that was just the final tipping point. Well, everybody with every incident would come to my social media because once again, I have a wide variety of friendships. I got thug friends, lawyers, doctors, cops all in one place. So I was like, hmm, how can I do something or cultivate these conversations that I'm having off the record into a space? And so I'm like, shit, the barbershop, that's where it goes down and we talk it about everything be. under the sun. Let's talk about real, some real shit, <laughs> you know? And so that's, that's where the concept came from. I was basically sitting on the couch eating a bag of Doritos and I called my cousin Christy Allen. She's a St. Louis, uh, retired sergeant now and I'm like cousin I'm thinking about doing she like you should do it I think that's an awesome idea and hey, so man, I start reaching out a sense now man understand like how it all came about you know what I'm saying like oh, you know giving us the history that's that's actually dope man like you say having all those different you know uh, individuals and different professions and because we understand who, who been to the barbershop we understand what that entails but that's community based but you bringing in the sources in the different creeds of people with different education and stuff like that, and bringing the information to the to the shop and open it to the and open it to the public. You know what I'm saying? So at first we were nervous about opening it up to the public because we thought it was just gonna be a big shouting match. We okay. thought uh, it was gonna come, they was gonna be screaming, we gonna be screaming, and, and we ain't gonna get nothing accomplished. So a bit at first we did, but then when we did, we did shout at each other and scream. But then when we were we had empathy for one another because we empathize with them. Like I told them, your protesting is helping me as a, I'm black. <laughs> so I'm riding with you. Although I don't agree with everything that you're saying, I agree with you in some ways, but empathize with me and what I got to do as well. Because every day you're showing, for some activists, they're showing up when there's an officer involved shooting. For me, I'm showing up when there's every shooting. And I have to deal with that trauma. I have to be the one to go tell somebody they family member dead, or I have to try to solve their case through the hood politics of no snitching. You feel me? And then helping people understand that this ain't this is a difficult task because then if somebody do tell me something, I got to protect the, their their well being to make sure nobody doesn't knock their head off. Hang on one second, Q. Um, my wife is calling me. That's who keep interrupting. Give me one second. I'm, I'm gonna get priority, man. Hey, in the building, man. in the green room, man. We got um Ty Dennis, man, um, founder and CEO, 
Clippers and Cops, man, awesome thing, man. A barbershop talk, man, with the uh, community and 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 uh, law officials, um, political officials, and uh, you guys tap in, man. It's, he's on Instagram, um, Clippers and Cops. Um, this guy's well decorated, retired officer from Atlanta Police Department, man, and he's a he's a he's an awesome brother. So you know, we got him in the building. Uh, been a long time, man. We haven't seen each other in a long time. So this is like a catch up for the both of us, most definitely. So you got a minute, man, where he's going to do his thing. You guys go ahead and tap in your phone, go to Instagram. Uh, it could be on Facebook as well, but it's Clippers and Cops. And this is Mr. Ty Dennis giving us the rundown, man, of how this awesome program uh, came about. And if he come to a city near you, you guys be sure to tap in and bring a friend, you know what I'm saying? So, Mr. Ty, he's back, he's back, he's back. So, you go ahead and finish, my brother. So, like I was saying about with the activists, um, several of them, we like we, we talk regularly, or we talk when we can about different things and stuff like that. Uh, one of them, Dante Carter, he basically doing the George Floyd protest, man. We talked every day. And he asked me, he said, do you go to therapy? I'm like, for what? <laughs> He was like, just to release. He was like, with all this trauma and the different stuff that you're seeing, he's like, you like a a, 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 a soldier over in Iraq. He's like, you need to go talk to somebody. He said, matter of fact, I go. I got a session for you. Go. And I went. And it was very therapeutic. And I think as a black male, we got to, as black people, we got to trust in therapy. You know, a lot of people think if you go to therapy, you crazy or no, nah, you we, you can't hold all this stuff in and expect it not to explode. And that's why a lot of people have such tempers. Let me, the let me, they, like, right. And, and I want to say this too, man. It's, it's crazy that you, 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 you go on that route because I'm just going to say myself too, but looking at you, but you explaining, because looking at you and like knowing what you do, but you're saying what you had to endure and, and visualize because you only know that when somebody tell you this stuff. So when you share the story and I'm still looking at you, I'm like, man, you carry that well. You understand know what I'm saying? Because we don't. The reason, I, but. For I'm me, saying, and, and I'm I, saying visually looking at you and looking at your social media, you you always smile. You always about business and you, you, you don't, um, you had laid down. It's like now nah, I got the, like the like the marathon continues like real spiel. You know what I'm saying? It does because for me, I love my life. I love the life that I've created. I love my family, and that is I have a release where it ain't policing twenty four seven. One of my good police partners committed suicide two weeks ago. You know what I'm saying? And people don't understand. <laughs> Everybody don't handle all of this and what we have to deal with. Uh, one of the activists uh, told me, she said, I think the police should have to go to therapy every Friday. And I said, I think that's a great idea, but who's going to pay for it? I said, as a, an adult, I think all of us need therapy every Friday. And I ain't talking about uh, cracking open a beer therapy, just basically releasing and understanding what just happened in your life or what just happened to you and moving on from it because it's hard to forgive and forget. I'm living proof. Like, don't, don't, like I tell people, don't get it twisted. <laughs> I do, I'm not perfect. I don't live a perfect life. I just handle it better than most because I, I wake up every day happy, man. When I used to be a police officer, I used to work day shift. I used to come in. This one dude said, why are you so happy all the damn time? I said, because I was past 25 and look at me thriving in a world that I wasn't best. If I would have told you what I was going to be able to do with my life, a lot of people would have said, yeah, right. And so I'm greedy. I want more. I want more for my kids. I, I want more for the world. I want to leave the world better than I found it. And Man. that's why I do it. Clippers and cops, when we get done, man, and you can feel the energy in the room of wow. blinders coming off, so not even knowing, like me and you was talking about, the law. Some people learn the law from their friends and Instagram and think that's true. Oh, I ain't, Jay-Z said, you ain't got to let them do this. And, da -da -da. and you like, man, that is, it depends on the circumstances, bro. 
and we're able to teach. But the best part about Clippers and Cops is the campus invasion. When we go into the schools, it is a whole different ball game. I created a PowerPoint presentation. I got several PowerPoint presentations trying to ex explain games to the powers that be. Most of our supervisors are older or white. And so to help them understand the culture, I used to create PowerPoint presentations to explain. It's almost like gangs for dummies. Those same PowerPoint presentations can be used to educate youth, to show them. I can show you my any case you think of and help you see that this ain't new, bro. This day, the same stuff you doing, somebody else doing. And when you explain it and help people, even uh, the YSL Rico case, that's my case. That's me and my partner case. And people so shocked about it eight years later. Like we, this case started in 2014, you know what I'm saying? And people don't understand that, investigations and stuff takes time and getting the proper resources to be able to do what we need to do as a detective, as a cop. It's not what I know is what I can prove legally. Right. And in the hood, I can find out what's going on through hood conversations, but I can't stand up in a court of law and say, well, what right. you said, something's it don't work like that. Right, right, right. And and, and I want to I want to I want to bag up something we was talking about too, man. For it's there because I was one of those people growing up, and I'm like, because I was taught that too. It's like, go see a go 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 see a therapist. But in in the hood, you know, we say a psychiatrist. I'm just really finding out that a psychiatrist and a therapist two different things. I, I I didn't know, so I was always turning out like, wait, don't talk to for what. It's like no therapy is something different. Not you know, you're not a not a shrink, and people need to know that. Though. Like you say, all black people, we need to really know that there's a person in a profession where we can literally go to and not feel those constraints of being you know deemed. You know what I'm saying? You know what whatever 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 people might call a person. You know what I'm saying? They think that's 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 crazy or whatever, man. So I'm glad you you actually spoke on that. But go go ahead. But all I'm saying is I'm. Through Clippers and Cops, we've learned so much from other people that have heard about Clippers and Cops. Clippers and Cops started on 384 Edgewood and has been to count, countless cities. We've been to Milwaukee, Memphis, Dallas, Florence, Alabama, like cities. We've been to different countries through Zoom. We went to different countries. We even fielded a call with the U.S. Embassy in Greece. They had over 20 countries on the calls with us. I've received emails and calls from Canada. Can you come to Canada to teach our police how to be? Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I never understood the impact that I was having. Uh, an elderly lady called me one time. I don't even know who the lady was. And she had me in tears. She said, you don't even understand the impact of what you're doing. And she said, eventually, years from now, you might, it might register with you. And so I take pride in that. I take pride in changing the narrative of showing people that there are some real good cops. There are some cops just like you that care about the people and care about making our world better. No cop became a cop to be rich because you ain't going to be rich, <laughs> okay? But you can make a good living and you're dealing with people on their worst days of their life a lot of times, so they're not thinking shit. So you have a chance to imp to change their trajectory in life or empathize with them to help them get through that moment. That's something that they'll never forget. For sure. Hey, man, hey, man, hey brother, Ty, man, listen, man, I appreciate you, man. I mean, literally, like, man, I, listening to you, man, and even myself getting better understanding, man, it's like, bro, I thank God for you, bro. Um, and all the things that you have explained and been transparent about, man, and just, just yourself, man, and your, your spirit, man, like you, you put off a vibe that, hey, man, it's real, man. You need help, come to me. If I can help you, I can. It's too many people out here, yeah. can, bro. They ain't, they the not. The thing about Gandhi said this, man. The 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 thing about life, the goal in life is to learn a gift and learn something and not keep it, pass it on. And for me. I want to pass on as much knowledge as I know to so many people 
that when judgment day comes for me, whenever, and hopefully that's whenever from now, I want God to say, God, job well done. Exactly. And pass the message of help thy neighbor, help people. Like, what is it the point of me having $40 million if I'm not helping nobody? What is it the reason of me knowing all this stuff that I know and not helping somebody else? Because guess what? After If I don't spread the love to somebody else, after I die, all that knowledge dies. And yeah. so people all talk about what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with these youth need to get it together. Okay, what are you doing? A lot of people like to talk, but a lot of people don't want to get their hands dirty and put their hands down in the dirt and plant that seed. And that's the hard part because and some people talk you. people that's out here putting in the work. I said, I, I, I made a post. I, was, I made a post. I said, when do saving lives become a competition? Like I'm doing because what I'm doing. It's, it's, it's me doing what I'm doing from what I know and the resources I have. Don't knock me. I survived. I'm looking at all of us like we survived. I survived, bro. There's a statistic that said this is impossible from the things that we, some, some, some of us went through. I'm like, look at me. And I'm only posting most of the time to say, if I done it, you can. And I'll show you how I done it. That's I it. Well, I made it. That made it possible. Right. It's funny you say that because I made a post after my buddy uh, committed suicide about, and it basically said, for anybody that's reading this, if you ever need somebody to talk to right. and you feel like at your brink, give me a call. I will, I don't care who you are, because I feel like hopefully I can say something that spare your life, to know that it's more to life than that day. After every storm, the sun comes out. <laughs> Watch it. You know what I'm saying? And once the sun come out, it's better days to come. God will not take you anywhere that he can't pull you out of. He takes you there to pull you closer to him to help you understand his role and what who he is. And a lot of people try to block it. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do it my way or I'm going to do it like this. And it's you like, no, <laughs> Every, or, or, there's a divine reason and why it happened. Those storms, I was talk, I always say the storm. People, we have storms in our life, right? You need a new roof. God sent a tornado and tear down your whole house and get you a new, whole house. But some people still be mad that they lost their house. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, so, in, in, in one of the analogies that I've just actually learned within the last, I'm going to say last 60 days, I saw a video and he was in a guy, he might've been a minister and he was explaining like what you're saying. And he, and people, I, I think we had it wrong because people say, God won't put no more on you than what you can bear. And he said, that's not true because God will. But the reason why he will, because he want you to give it to him. So when you get in the way, you wind up carrying all that crap when you should have just gave it to God. He got it. You <laughs> been all right and everything would have fell in line and so like i keep saying when we see better we do better and what that means is find somebody that is doing what you would like to do or you think you may want to do and mimic them or ask them what did they do we don't have to figure this out. The crazy part about this generation is they got, you remember we used to have Encyclopedia Britannicus and you it's had to get one of the- It's all I read growing up. Man, now you got it at your fingertips. So anything- still got the book. I still have the Encyclopedia Britannicus. I still got them. <laughs> the whole collection. Showing your age, bro. But the reason I'm saying, what I'm saying is- <laughs> Fingertips, and you're able to look up and research anything that you want. And like I tell students when I talk to them, don't sit up in class and let your teacher just tell you whatever they tell you, because they can only tell you what they know. And if you feel like it's it's just like history, right? I, me and my secretary had a debate about history, and I said it's not black history; it's history. I said, name a time because we were talking about Trump. And I said, name a time in American history when America was great. 
And she was like, I said, never. So when you say make America great again, that's a lie. Like America's never been great. <laughs> and I started at 1492 and did a whole PowerPoint for her. And her mouth was to the floor because St. Louis in itself is built on segregation. The way the city is set up, segregation. Dred Scott case here in St. Louis. The courthouse right up under the arch, they used to sell slaves on the steps. Redlining. All these different things are still there. And so I lived in the area near what's called the Del Mar Divide. Del Mar Boulevard separated the haves from the have-nots, and we didn't even know it. Growing up, the pizza delivery person didn't come past Del Mar. And growing up, in, when you grow up poor or I ain't gonna, my mama told me to stop saying you was poor. She said, name something you didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I was happy with that one. But when you grow up in the hood, you don't, people think that you striving for a buckhead or something. I don't know buckhead. <laughs> I know the hood. I know what I know. To, to me, this is home. I, I used to, you'll see me put up a meme sometimes of a, um, of a cow stepping over alligators and the alligators not biting. I said, that's what it's like in the hood. For me, I knew the killers, drug dealers and everything, but they was family. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They not going to bother me. They ain't no threat to me. They're a threat to anybody coming in this place. So that's what a lot of people don't understand. And I tell people, take the time to understand and, and empathize with people and stuff that you know nothing about. Because cool. don't go back and judge people and say, why they living like that or why they doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you know why? Go ask them why. Go find out why. A lot of the stuff that they're dealing with would have broke you. <laughs> so who are you to judge? Hey, you can't. You can't. Mr. Ty Dennis, check this out. Mr. GoPro in life, man. Explain that, explain that phrase to us, my brother. Man, for the, for the kids, man. Every kid, especially including myself, I thought I was going pro in sports. But when you look at it, technically I went pro in life. <laughs> mm -hmm. You are able to take care of yourself as an adult. You are a professional adult. So you're yeah. pro in life. Yeah, they, they make millions of dollars playing the sport. That's awesome. But give yourself some credit for being able to accomplish what you've accomplished in life. Right. It ain't always – think about where you are now and think about back then when you wanted to be where you are now. And so that's where that came from. Um, I didn't – I played professional basketball in Columbia, South America before I became a cop. But I've accomplished far more with my brain. And father time is undefeated. You can only play sports for so long. And at some point, even look at LeBron. LeBron been playing for 20 years. But guess what? At some point, he's going to have to sit it down. And guess what? He's a good businessman. So he's pro in life. <laughs> that I, pro in life is going to last longer. Right, right, right. Awesome, awesome, man. Awesome, awesome. And I, and I learned, too, uh, when I was younger, applying for, you know, uh, employment and – um. Um, I had a business consultant that was teaching me at the time, you know, how to, to uh, complete an application properly, right? And he was asking me about my employment history. And I think I was applying for, uh, I used to work at the Wendy's over there in the West End as a cook, right? And uh, at the t and before that, he was asking me about my work history. He was like, uh, how long you been cooking? And we were just having a general conversation. So I was like, man, I've been cooking since I was like 10, 12 years old. So when he was showing me how to, to uh, you know, fill out the application, he was like, so why did you put two, three years on this? Right? He was like, now everything you've done is under your belt. He was like, you got 20 years worth of cooking, but you put on this application, you had two or three years of experience. So I'm just saying that and telling you, you know, you got to put, you have, you, you a professional in your own, in your own lane and be great in life, man. Like you just said, man, a lot of people have a lot of knowledge of, of things and might not have a degree or something like that, but that shouldn't stop you from moving forward in your mission and your vision and your dreams, right? That's it. For me, I laugh because I was the keynote speaker at a graduation uh, this past summer, mm -hmm. and they put my resume basically in this book, the program. And like I said before, I've done so much that you don't even sit down and think. I don't even sit down and think about all the stuff that I did because to me, it ain't the reason I'm doing it. You know what I'm saying? It feels good to be recognized, but my appeal is to God. You know what I'm saying? And so 
I don't build myself up to be like, I'm Ty Dennis or <laughs> not. other people will do that for you. You know what I'm saying? Now, do I know I hold some weight? Yeah, I know I can hold some weight. <laughs> I got some. I, 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 <laughs> right, right. Rims, but <laughs> I don't think that go to my head because all of that one mistake and that all can be taken away, but they can't right, take away. Right. Right, so, so. right, for sure, for sure. Now, I'm looking too, like, now, through all of your uh, extensive awards and accreditations and acknowledgement, what was Ty Dennis' aha moment? Because we understand, like you told us, like, man, all this don't mean then I love the work I do, but looking at, like, like your plaques on the wall and, and all of that stuff like that, what was what was that moment that you saluted yourself and uh, patted yourself on the back? What was one of those moments? My first day on my new job. Because when I walked in my office, in the office for the first time, I got hired on Zoom because it was during the pandemic. And when I walked in the office for the first time, I'm looking around because I hadn't been there since I got expelled. <laughs> mm. And when they showed me what my office was, my office was the conference room where I got expelled. And so while I'm sitting with the superintendent, he, I'm looking around with a little laugh, on an aha moment, like literally like, if these mugs would have looked at me now, and he asked me, he said, what's so funny? I said, did they tell you I got expelled out of here? He said, no, they told me you're one of the most decorated officers in the Southeast and probably in the country. And I said, wow, like, I have to let that go. Tell him but no. <laughs> I'm ashamed of it. I want people to know. I don't want, don't, don't believe this. I am, like I said earlier, I am a real one. I I dress for the part, but <laughs> right. the reason right. is when I tell people my life has been a full circle with me coming back and sitting in that office, I have aha moments when I'm sitting around thinking about the people that thought I wasn't going to be shit or the people that got expelled turn their back or the teacher sitting in class telling us we weren't shit. And I actually took the teacher that lied on me to lunch. And he didn't even know that he, when I called, I reached out to him to tell him thank you. And he was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you lied on me. He didn't even know it. I said, this is why diversity matters. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, because you didn't understand my slang. You said what you thought I said, which got me 43 days, which changed my whole life for the better. But thank you for doing it. You know what I'm saying? And he actually brought me in as a speaker at his school and things like that. So that was my aha moment because I was able to come back and show everybody that I wasn't what they thought I was, was and was going to be. And I've been able to do so much more through it. That is what motivates me to help other people like me that have been through stuff that people have counted out to show them that, no, nah, look at me. If, if anybody look at me, you can do anything that you put your mind to. Bruh, I tell you, I make I start making calendars in my freshman year in college, and I still do it, and everybody laughs at me. One of my officers pick on me all the time talking about, you know you have a planner. I don't I got a planner right here. I don't use that. I do a I do a calendar because I'm able to see what I got. It keeps me organized. Oh, I got a million and one things going on. And organization helps me be able to when I gotta study or do something, helps me be organized for that. And yeah. a lot of people they just don't remember everything and then it's like, oh snap, I forgot. Like, nah, man, write it down. And people don't know how easy that is, man. That's actually those calendars, actually how I conduct my life. You know what I'm saying? And that uh, that organized, being organized, man, have helped me tremendously, bro. You just don't know when I get up, I'm always like, okay, I need to do this. And I find myself completing those tasks because I'm looking at them. And I and, and, and every, every quarter or every couple of months, I host a vision board and I keep trying, you know, have done it for young men. Like, no, we got to come in here and put that on them. Because like you said earlier, even people that have maybe they're in their 20s or 30s and I'm always like, what do you want to do? Can, if you can see it, like you say, if you can see it, you if you, you can believe what you see, right? And I'm like, put it down and then 
let's start putting ourselves in those places around those individuals. You know what I'm saying? Let's let's get to them. You want to play football? Let's go talk to a coach. You want to be a business person? Let's go talk to a business, somebody in management, somebody in corporate, somebody in the bank. Let's understand what it takes to start knocking those obstacles down and get there. That's my that's that's all I'm showing people. Like, let's get there. Let's learn how to do uh, budgeting, marketing. I'm doing all this stuff because I'm just like I, I tried to make myself more self sufficient, so I, I I wouldn't have to spend the money I didn't have, right? So now I'm doing you know media marketing graphics. I'm like I gotta I gotta I gotta learn. But I had this like what you just said and what I share with you too. You can be whatever you want to be and learn whatever you want to learn if you take the time to learn it. That's it. And the thing about it is people play on social media, myself included, all day. And it's people on there making money. It's people on there living. Like somebody said to me, they said, man, you live. You and your wife always doing something. And I'm like, that's what I allow you to see. <laughs> it's more to me than that. You know what I'm saying? But that's what I allow you to see because guess what? It, it, if you ain't popping, people don't care. And so I, I'm i always popping in, in, in my social media tell it. But guess what? Some nights on Friday night, I'm sitting up in here curled up with my kids, man, watching a Disney movie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Social but media, people don't... everybody got, got us flim flam with that social media, man. Even though it's, it's nice to see, but people are so into, I feel like it's about social media. Social media gives the people the information into your life. And it's like, if you don't put them in your business, they don't think you about it. Well, you got I money. So if you don't put it on social media, they feel like it ain't, ain't going on. I'd be like, hey, hey, what you want to think? <laughs> is the devil in some aspects, but it's also great in some aspects. Because I spoke with my buddy from CNN yesterday. And he said, man, I love what you're doing with Clippers and Cops, man. You're doing so much. Da, 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 da. You, you, he's like, he thought I had like a whole marketing team or something. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I said, Me and my guys, and we, I try to post as much as I can yeah. to keep us relevant when we're not doing anything. You know what I'm saying? Because right. once again, people, if people don't see you working, they don't want, they don't want you. You could be the best at it, but if nobody else People want what everybody else wants. And once they see that you active, guess what? They want you, hey, can you come to my school? Can you this, you that? Yeah, of course I can. And But what we're selling sells itself. We are 5013 c But in every major city in America, there's a youth violence problem. There's a gang problem. There's an uptick in violence. And what we're talking about and trying to do is that. And even... Uh, Mayor Dickens, shouts out to Andre Dickens. He's he's a friend of mine. He right. was trying to get me, and but I know what I'm worth. You know what I'm saying? And I know that I occupy a lot of different spaces. And for the people, you would have to ask yourself, what is their worth to your city? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And for me, to uproot my family again to come back to fix a problem that. You know I can fix. What is that worth to you? What is it worth to you? And they can only answer that question. So that's why I continue to do what I do, and I do it here in St. Louis. It's received totally different here in St. Louis because St. Louis and Atlanta is two different places. St. Right. Louis is a small city. And so um, the recognition that I get here in St. Louis, it's much different, but this is the same, the same thing. I'm going to show you something real quick. The same things in both cities. Wow. Right, right. Of course, Anna, we always take a picture at the end, and we have been to countless shops and different things like that. But we went to Milwaukee, man. And this is, shout out to Milwaukee. We went to a steak restaurant, man. They literally put our logo into the menu. And read what that say. I really can't see it on here. It's like, welcome to Carnivore in Milwaukee. Thank you for being part of the change you want to see in our community. Things like that is motivation to do more. You know what I'm saying? Because I met the lady, Arletta Slaughter, at a conference in Savannah. And she didn't even come to our presentation. 
uh, these other ladies did. And when I got to the airport, the other ladies like Clippers and cops. Oh man, you got to check them out. And so she was like, let me get your card. And I gave her my card. And then we happened to be on the same flight. And so on the flight, I was able to show her the videos, all the different stuff. And she was like, oh my God, I got to get y'all to Milwaukee. And I'm like, okay, I'll send you a proposal. Yeah, let's see if we can make it happen. Six months later, she made it happen. Yeah. And it was an experience. We didn't even know that Milwaukee was voted as one of the most, if the most racist or segregated city in the country or something. So when we went to uh, the radio station, Tory Lowe, shouts out to him. He's the uh, uh, disc jockey or DJ for the radio station. He was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go in on y'all. And we was only there for 30 minutes. We yeah. was there for like half, three hours. Because he was like, we've never had cops come in here, let alone cops like y'all. Wow. And it's like, he, all I know to do is be real. Um, and I told him, I said, we we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. But I want you to respect my response as you want me to listen to what you're saying. Because I'm not your tip. You can't just say whatever to me. And I'm just going to sit there and be like, I'm scared. No, it doesn't work like that. We We can agree to disagree. You know what I'm saying? And if you're right, I will admit that you're right. But if I'm if I'm understand my right or my point of view as well and respect it as well, don't just say what you say and then want me to shut up or something or talk over me or something. Like, no, nah, it don't work like that. For sure, for sure. Mr. Ty Dennis, we we gonna uh we enjoyed the state. Before we get out of here, man, three I'm gonna ask you three things, right? I want you to okay. tell our clippers and cop, tell us how to be involved, where you guys gonna be at next. I want you to shout out your team and I want you to leave us and the youth and the community, man, in this time and this space and this hour where our community and families and youth are in a turmoil, man. It seems like everybody's just agitated for some reason, man. Give it to us how you want to give it to us in no particular order, sir. Clippers and Cops, you can follow us on Clippers and Cops, follow us on clippersandcops.org, Clippers and Cops on Instagram. Twitter, uh, Facebook, we're on every social media platform. If you want to check out old meetings, videos, you can go to Clippers and Cops on YouTube. Uh, shouts out to my team. I don't do Clippers and Cops by myself. I'm just Ralph Tresman of the group. Uh, my team, uh, Dante Booker, Michael Seiden, Tyrone Finney, Andre Lowe, Ford Curry, Michael Carter, Maurice Sweeney, uh, Kim Underwood, Ruben Houston, uh, my girl Press is on the, uh, she take uh, photos, dope shots. Uh, you can follow her. She does great uh, videos and media. Um, the crazy part about the relationships with our team is I have a relationship with each person and each person was handpicked for a reason. Um, the crazy part about my buddy Ruben Houston, uh, AKA Rico Richie, the song, if you ain't got haters, you ain't got no haters, you ain't popping. He and I actually met in 2015 on a federal search warrant. I actually arrested him. And he was on his way to sign a million dollar record deal with Birdman. And I was with the ATF at the time and we executed a federal search warrant at his recording studio. And he was like, please let me catch this flight. And I'm like, if I don't find nothing, we'll try to get you out of here. Well, I found 11 pounds of weed and $43,000 in cash. And unfortunately he couldn't make the flight. Mind you, we had been on the search warrant from 3 a.m. to noon. So by the time I left with him, I was hungry. So my big ass stopped at Chick-fil-A and I got me something. Well, I'm human. I'm not going to eat. In, I don't care who it is. I'm not going to sit here and eat in front of you. So I said, yo, bro, you want something? He said, what? He's like, what? Man? I don't want nothing. I ain't no snitch. <laughs> I said, I don't need you to snitch. I already got you. But if you want something, you better sell them. Otherwise, I'm going to pull off. He got something to eat. He ain't never talked to us at all in no way, shape, or form. And whatever happened later happened. Four years later, I'm working at Atlanta Fair, and I see him walking towards me. So, like I said, I'm a real one. I step back like, uh-oh, I don't know what this man on. He said, nah, man, I want to shake your hand. And I'm like, for what? He said, man, you're the first cop to treat me like a human being. If you ever need me for anything, let me know. And I called him. We went to talk to Georgia Tech's basketball and football team. He played football at Georgia Tech. 
And he has a crazy story. I won't ruin it. But he basically comes with us to tell his side of the story. He ain't the police. He did a lot of things. And he has a crazy story. Uh, what was the last question you asked? Send them our way, man. We would love to have his story, story testimony, man, on QTV. Or uh, the last one was, man, just get the youth in the community, man. Give us a give us a positive message, man, how we can better out tomorrow, man, and how to stay out the way. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Don't continue to talk about what's wrong with the world. Don't continue to make the world in your world, your, your city, your block, your building, whatever. Don't continue to make it a bad place to live when and you being the cancer um just like cancer in the body a cancer has to be removed and at some point the the laws is going to remove you or your your ops are going to remove you so don't become that cancer make better choices life is but a dream you can do anything in your life that you put your mind to president obama what do you think they told him when he said he wanted to be the president <laughs> and he became the president so you can do anything with your life uh don't go with the what with whatever everybody else is doing if you feel like you're different you feel like you want to be different then you do that everybody people are going to laugh and make jokes about things that they're scared to do themselves uh, when i told people i was going to be a cop they laughed and was like ah what you doing that for and those same people called me today for advice so don't be afraid to be different don't be afraid to be original don't be afraid to be you even if, if you rap don't keep making the same auto-tune, hot girl summer music that's driving everybody to do crazy stuff. Like, there's go back to slow songs and love making and caring about our community. Nobody's coming down here to save us until Jesus Christ and our Lord and Savior comes back. We have to save us, and it starts with each one of us putting in the work to be able to do that. Um, our next Clippers and Cops event is on the 18th that I'm doing here in St. Louis. My guys are going to eventually do something in Atlanta again, and we'll definitely be doing something in November. I'm trying to work to partner with someone in Chicago to take the program to Chicago in November, and eventually we'll be back and forth in Atlanta during our campuses invasion. If people are interested in bringing us to their city, bringing us to their school, bringing us to their youth group, hit us up on one our website, clippersandcops.org, or inbox us on Instagram, and we'll try to make it happen to see if we can make it work. Uh, the thing is, is trying to get seven people to travel. It do come with a price tag. We do have to take off of work and different things like that. And so that's why I said we need a corporate sponsor to make that happen. If we're able to do that, then we'll be able to change the world. Yeah, man, I'm a 501c3, man. Do I get a discount? Because I sure want to bring, bring you guys out, man. If, can it be half of y'all? <laughs> you, I, 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 I got to get you guys in. You always been a solid brother from day one. Sir. And you got to do is call me, man, and we're playing around it and make something work to make it work. No charge. <laughs> oh man, you know what got it, got, 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 we, got, we got to put it everywhere it need, it need to be at, bro. We need to, we need to put it everywhere it need to be. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's about money for me personally, it's not about money, but at the same time, I do have a wife and three kids, so I don't want, I can't take out of their mouth to feed the world. I can't feed the world in my own house is crumbling. You know what I'm saying? So that's the reason behind some of that. And just trying to, you know, it's a lot of ways to fund this. We don't care how it's funded. We just want to be able to do what we do. And I love doing, if it was up to me, if, I, if somebody could put a million dollars in my pocket and I could do this full time, I honestly and truthfully feel like I could change the world. And I think the team believes the same thing because we're passionate about what we're doing. It's not just a fly-by-night thing. We live, breathe, and sleep this stuff. And we try to make – we want to, like I just said, we want to be the change that we want to see. We tired of bridging the gap. We want to fill the gap and move on and build on that. Hey, man, that's real, man. Hey, in the green room, QTV, we got the brother, man. The big dog is on the playground, man. Ty Dennis in the building, man, CEO and founder of Clippers and Cops. He told you where to find. He told you how to get involved. He gave you the Instagram and the Facebook, Clippers and Cops, and it's clippersandcops.org, I believe the good brother said. Man, y'all tap in, man. We're going to keep this good brother in our prayers and his whole team, man, as they travel to back and forth and all that good stuff. Grab some of that merch when you see them. Tap in, leave them a message, man. Tell them some good stuff, positive vibes, big vibes, positive vibes. 
Hey, it's Dr. Harbo QTV. We got the brother Ty Dennis in the building. I spelled his man wrong early. He tapped in and told me, hey, man, that ain't that ain't what's popping, Q. I got it right, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but y'all make sure, man, y'all love on yourself, man, and uh, take care of yourself and each other. Until the next time, man, it's Dr. Harbo. Ty Dennis in the building, man. We love you, my brother. Continue to do what you're doing, man. The saga and the, and the marathon continues, man. We love what you're doing, brother. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up, man. If anything we can do, promote it. Have you back on in your team, man. The, our platform is okay. Right.